Well, it's exciting to be back here again. Is there anything more important than our health? I, I'm always amazed uh, how, how we can have that paradigm shift in our own mind that everything's going great, wonderful, and then we have that emergency and life changes on a dime. If not, we lose that life in a moment. And in the last couple of years, um, many of us have experienced sad experiences from that, some from COVID, some because of COVID and people who can't get in. Um, it's very frustrating. And probably what's been the most frustrating thing to me in the last, uh, I guess we'll say 18, 19 months, I like rounding things off. I always say you shouldn't round up, but I'm gonna say the last two years. But the, the number of times that I've heard that we need to protect the integrity of our healthcare system. It, it just absolutely drives me beyond uh, my ability to sit there and listen and I, and I wanna get up and leave the room. This, this is about the people. And I, I've got so many life experiences that, that again, as Don Sharp has said, of people that have approached me and, and talked to me about these problems, it, it, it's just, it, it's frustrating. And, and protecting the integrity of the healthcare system is really uh, code for protecting the integrity of the government, uh, the, the ones in power. We, we've had, you know, three different governments from the, the PCs to the NDP to the UCP. And, and they've each had a crack at the bat. They've each had four years. We can go back with the PCs way back. Um, you know, Marvin was just showing me some stuff back to 1972 when Premier uh, Lougheed took, took over. And, and it's appalling. Um, I was just talking to Brian and saying, well, you know, the, the problem is, and, and, and I, I've heard this so often, is that, well, that, that, that's, that, that's business smart and everything else, but you don't understand. It, it, it's not politically smart. We, we can't do that because of politics. Um, it's it just, are, are you kidding me? How, how can you say, how can you stand in front of somebody and, and say to them that, that it's just not politically right? You know, and, and again, Marvin talked and named off some of the health ministers that he spoke with, and, and they just said that, well, politically, we can't do that. Well, I, I think that's what's wrong, is that we're focused on, on political and, and polls, which drive so many of our politicians, rather, rather than the integrity of the system. And, and I'm going to jump back, and I, I've talked to Don before, I've talked to George Porter, and I'm going to start with the, the giant in the room right now. Maybe I should go back all the way to 2007 when uh, there was a commission, uh, a study put out by two MLAs, and they were studying the paramedics and the ambulance service. And when they first came up with that, and, and again, Danny, how many minutes do I have here now? Because this could be a... <laughs> Okay, yeah, when you want to jerk me off, we've got the, the wonderful, talented, articulate Daniel Smith waiting to, um, you, you've got something to look forward to. So <laughs> her, her, her chuckle will wake you up if nothing else does. Um, anyways, they, they, they put up a report um, on the ambulance service. And, I, I, and again, I, I, I didn't go back and go with the numbers. So please, you know, these are by memory and my memory's getting foggy with all the data that keeps going in. But they came up with a report and says, you know, if we took over the entire ambulance service, it only cost us $63 million. And, and two of these MLAs are from rural Alberta. And, and I, I want to go back and say, that you have to realize um, Alberta is a big place. It's very diverse. And you can go to the smallest, quaintest little town in Alberta and find a wonderful little hotel. And I want to say one of the gem on the prairies is in um, Claire's home. A uh, wonderful little hotel there, and, and it's got little rooms in there that I, I don't know when it was built, the 50s or 60s, but, but people love to go and visit there. But I love the hotel industry and the fact that it can be a one star or a five star, and, and you get to pick. What, what do you want to do? You, you can't go into Claire's home and ask um, for a hotel like this. It's not going to be there. So should we shut down the hotel industry and say, well, you're not allowed to, to have anything? If you can't provide a five-star hotel, you don't have a right to put up a hotel. But, but that's the mentality that they took with the ambulance service and with healthcare. And they started shutting down rural hospitals and rural ambulances, the volunteers, because they weren't a five-star system. I said, are you kidding me? Um, if somebody lives in a, in a small little town, whether it's Sterling or Glenwood, these are areas that I represented in the past, they, they had a phenomenal volunteer ambulance service, fire service, all volunteer. These, these little towns um, had their people coming forward. This was a community and they raised the money. 
to buy the ambulances and, and to have them and they'd send their people and, and pay for their education. And maybe they are only a level one paramedic, but yet it was amazing in a small little town, 20 minutes from Lethbridge, how, how they had a, a time best in the province of under 90 seconds to, to get to most calls. But, um, you know, centralized big healthcare says, well, that's not good enough because when somebody arrives here, they got to have the full complete training because what if that person is in a, a situation with a collapsed lungs and, and doesn't have all of that? 90 seconds, 90 seconds. They, they walked around in their town, went off. Uh, whoever was closest got the ambulance. The other people all went there. They merged at that house. They knew where everybody lived and they would pick that person up and, and he was off. But, oh no, it's much better to wait 20 minutes for a full-fledged ambulance coming from Lethbridge to pick that person up when in fact that person could actually be in the hospital. But anyways, it's, it's just frustrating. But what was amazing when they did that report and they said, oh, this is gonna be great. It's only gonna cost us $63 million. We can have full five-star service across the province. It's wonderful. And then they realized, oh my goodness, a year later, um, we had all these paramedics, they weren't getting paid. We, we thought the 63 million was paying everybody. And so all of a sudden, when you put a, you know, a full-fledged paramedic into a small community, you have to be there. Um, I'm not sure what they get paid, Don. But anyway, it's significantly more than a volunteer. And all of a sudden, we couldn't afford it. And to me, ambulance service has been shrinking and, and been demoralized ever since they stripped away this idea of, of a, a low-level paramedic or a volunteer ambulance person to rush somebody to the hospital. And I, I want to jump back here again, and I'm going to be jumping back and forth here and following my notes kind of, but, you know, in 1776, the most amazing revolution on the planet took place, in my opinion, and, and this fight for freedom uh, was, was just incredible, and it's been a, a beacon of freedom for the world since, and many, many constitutions um, are, are based on the U.S. Constitution, but what I find fascinating when you look how little our constitution and our rights have changed in the last 225 years or whatever versus what's changed in the healthcare system, it's unbelievable. And, and I want to use this analogy that if you go back there in this fight for freedom, but, but you know what the, 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 the biggest treatment that they usually had for, for President Washington back then when he was feeling sick? It was to, to bleed him, that the poison's got to be in the blood. So here you are, you're weak, you're, you're, weak, you're sick, you, you can't hardly cope. And what do they do? They, they would they, they take the blood out of them. And we know now today that it's wrong. Um, but yet, this is what's happening with our economy and with our constitution. What, what we're doing is wrong. We're protecting the wrong things. We're blaming the wrong um, area. And, and we got to refocus. And... This central run and operated know-all AHS is wrong. It's deplorable. And I'm going to go through a few examples of, of what's so wrong with it and, and why we need to change it. And, and sorry, Danny, I guess I didn't do what everybody else said. Danny picked that subject. And if we're just going to fix the Canadian Health Act and say, don't worry about it, we're leaving Canada, we're going to have an Alberta Act, so we don't need to fix theirs. <laughs> <laughs> So sorry, Danny, I'm, I'm talking about the new Alberta Health Act and what we're going to do here and, and that we're going to have the best health care in the world and, and that beacon again where, where people are, the, the medical tourism, this should be the place in the world for medical tourism, um, where, where people come to get the treatments. I digress again. So let, let's go through a few examples. Um, when I was the MLA for Calgary Glenmore, I went up one night and, and I sat in the Rocky View to observe. And, and again, it, it's, it's one of the most painful nights in my life to sit there and watch and do nothing because I, I, I'm, I interfere, I, I interject. When there's a problem, I'm that one that's liable because I step forward to help. Don't touch them, you might get blamed for this, don't do this. Well, I, I, I don't think that rational, I, I get into that hyper mode that there's a problem here, we gotta fix and you jump in and you do the best you can and you take the consequences later rather than saying, well, I don't know that I'm qualified here. I'll just, uh, I'll wait for someone more qualified for myself. Um, and that doesn't work when you're a farm boy and you're growing up and things go, go sideways. Um, you, you have to look after the situation with what you have. Um, you have to be that entrepreneur. But so I, I'm up there. And again, it's it just frustrated me with these wait times. And, and, and you sit there and you go in the Rocky View back then. And this is, this is going back over 10 years now. 
Um, and, and you watch people coming in and lining up in front of this glass window that looks like you're at a bank with gold behind it, the way they're protecting you to, to go in there. Um, and you're some sort of criminal and you got to show your ID and everything else, you know, pass everything before you get in there. And, and at about 11.50 at night, an uh, uh, elderly senior came in bleeding, um, holding the rag to his head. Obviously, he'd fallen and cut it. Um, someone had dropped him off. And again, oh, so many things, just the parking and getting there and getting to an emergency. Uh, it's like going through the border and trying to get in somewhere, it seems like. Anyways, he comes staggering in. He's faint. And, and I want to jump up and help him. Oh, I'm going to get emotional on some of these things. It's terrible. But no, I, I can't do it. I've got to watch and see how the system is operating. And so this gentleman couldn't stand in the line. Oh, and, and he sits down. Nobody comes to help him. Nobody does anything. And you just sit there, you know, what, what's wrong with people? What's wrong with the system that, that, that you, you can just literally put up this wall and, and dismiss yourself from it? Anyways, that, that was just the first one. He sat there for, for an over an hour before he was finally good enough to get up and get in there. Um, I watched another individual come in, sick and, and, and stomach pain, whatever else. He went off and went into the washroom, and, and he was gone for more than an hour. And, and nothing, nothing happens. And you wonder, like, how is this possible? At four o'clock, another individual has been in the emergency room. The porter brings him out and brings him over to the door, um, going into the hospital because he's going to be admitted. And he sat there for two hours because they were short of porters on the other side where they couldn't take him and move him up to the hospital bed. And he's sitting there shaking, no blankets and cold, and, and sitting there. And you're just like, how can this be possible? How can people be so numb in a system? And it goes back historically when you look at these things and, and how, you know, the, the, the numbness gets in there because the, these are the orders. This is what we must follow. You know, you're not, uh, you're not supposed to think. You're supposed to follow the orders. And it's just wrong. It's unacceptable. And we need some political leadership that said it's not about politics. It's about actually serving the people. What are we going to do to fix this? And, and that political will to stand up and say, we're going to fix it. Don, um, I, I've talked to you. I've talked to George Porter. There's a very simple two-minute solution um, for the, the first big step with our ambulance service. When someone is at the hospital door and they've come through there, it's the hospital's responsibility to take immediate care for that individual. End of story. Done. <laughs> We, we, we don't need to go through long studies. And, and, and again, I appreciate, Don, what you're trying to do because you're, you're, uh, the tenacity and the fight that you and George Porter have put on for years is remarkable. But again, talk about beating your head against a brick wall with no changes happening. It, it's simple. When you show up at that hospital, it's their responsibility for those patients immediately. Let, let's just back up for the idea. Um, I don't know. I, I, I love guns and hunting and target shooting and all that stuff. It, it's something that I really enjoy. <laughs> you go to Cabela's. How many people have been to Cabela's? What do you do if you're going to the gun counter and you want service? There's a little tab there that you have to pull. And you get your number. I was there the other day and it was 008, or no, it was 8008. And I, holy smokes, and they, they, they were at 99. I thought, like, how is this possible? And so I went around the store and went over there anyways, it, it messed up. But the bottom line, the number one thing that we need when you come into the emergency room and, you're, and you're, you're okay or you're not okay, is that there's a Walmart greeter, a triage nurse that actually asks, how are you doing, sir? How are you doing, ma'am? What, what, what's your problem? What do you need? And, and, and you, they give you a number, you're, you're number 44 now, there's 43 other people in the room there, but you're 44, and they ask, and you say, well, I think I've got this terrible pain, and I've got appendicitis, I think and it's going to rupture, and all that, this, we're going to triage this one's up a little bit higher. Next person comes in, and well, I've got a headache, and I can't sleep, and this and that, well, this isn't too important, and, and they can have these numbers. But, but to say that someone has to stand in line to get in there is ridiculous, it's, it's easy. You come in, you pull your number, and they call you up. You can all go sit down, at least relax, and do that. These are common sense things that fingers should be able to snap and get fixed, and they don't do it. Um, to me, central anything is bad. Central government, central health care, central whatever, big unions. 
su success and where we go forward is always by that freedom of the entrepreneur to try something. Um, I, I was accepted as and into the, the University of Alberta pharmaceutical program. That's a story all in itself. I never did graduate because of health reasons and different complications. And again, life altering moments when somebody dies, um, it changes our pathways and where we end up. But anyways, the, the, there's just so many opportunities where, where an entrepreneur or, or someone discovers something and the way they're viciously attacked. One of my favorite stories is Dr. Barry Marshall. Um, and I always forget his cohort, um, Robin Warren. Um, how many people are familiar with this story? Because Anne brought it up about H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori. In the 1980s, one of the biggest health problems that we faced in North America was stress-related. And what was that? Anne? Ulcers. And, and it was a $5 billion a year industry going back there, three to $5 billion. And the big pharmaceuticals were really upset with this doctor who says, no, no, it's a gram negative um, thing and we can treat it and, and, and fix that. No, no way. And, and, the, and the pillaging and the personal attacks and stuff that this individual took is remarkable. And finally, in 1985, after three years of fighting, he took a, you know, went down there, took a gastrointestinal um, sample and showed that he didn't have any H. pylori and, and, and showed that his stomach was healthy. And then he, he basically took a lethal dose of H. pylori and, and then waited two weeks and then took a picture to show how his, you know, his stomach was going to rupture and, and, and it was life threatening. And, and then he took the antibiotic, but, but it took from 1985 to 2005 before he won the Nobel prize and the recognition of what a paradigm shift that was. But we go through this over and over again. 1985 is not that long ago. And so let, let's realize that, you know what, that there is a problem here. There isn't this freedom of, of treatment. Uh, again, uh, it was just very enlightening. We, we have some really talented, uh, intelligent individuals here. And Lieutenant Colonel Redmond last night opened up my eyes in one other area because I've always talked about civilian oversight for the police, um, how elected civilian oversight, how important that is. And, and I've never had that in my health discussions before, but we actually need elected civilian oversight over the College of Physicians and Surgeons. This is nuts. So you can thank Lieutenant Colonel Redmond for adding that to my, <laughs> my, my speeches here. But, <laughs> but, but the, these, are, these are simple, practical, doable things that, that for, for some politician to say that this isn't politically smart, you know you need to fire those individuals because you can also know that those individuals don't believe in accountability and they don't believe in recall. Uh, such a change, there, there's two or three things, and again, I'm gonna jump back because this isn't always about, should look at the time, how fast it's going here, but um, it, 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 it amazes me our resistance to change, even when it's a phenomenal opportunity, how few people ha have that courage to step up and say, I'm gonna try, try that. How many people tried to climb Mount Everest? Uh, very small group. How many people were successful? Um, well, there's a lot now, but, but technology has changed compared to the 50s when they didn't have very good equipment. But the, the medical things that we could go forward with are, are so amazing. I'm going to go to two other examples uh, from a small place called Lethbridge that, uh, again, um, it is, it's one of the regional hospitals. Uh, it, 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 you know, brought everything in there. But back in the early 2000s, one of the things that we always complained about in the longest problem was, was the wait time for MRIs. And, and again, where were they? They were in Calgary and Edmonton. If you're from rural Alberta, you got to get in there. And, and if it wasn't too serious, it was up to, you know, a year wait. Um, had an exp listened to an individual who um, started having spots in her eyes and, and little black spots, went to the ophthalmologist and he says, well, you know, uh, there's one of two things. One, you've got an infection and we'll treat it with antibiotics. Or two, you've got a tumor. And um, unfortunately, though, it, it's, you know, on a rush basis, I could probably get you in there six or nine months to get you in there. But if it's a tumor, it's too late. And he says, but, but I, I really don't want to lose my credibility. 
and, and send you up there for an MRI. And if it's not a tumor, I, I will lose my ranking um, and not be able to get you into this, get someone into the system next time when I think that there's something important. It's important that when I actually um, send somebody there that they diagnose it and there's a successful diagnosis and I was right because then my ranking goes up and my priorities are good and I can get somebody in there right away. And so this individual went home and they prayed about it and talked about it. And they thought, well, you know, actually two weeks. Well, and he did say, but for $695, you could go up there tomorrow or next week and get an MRI. Thought, well, wow, you know, like, like with that $695, they couldn't afford it. But yet that was an answer. They went home, they prayed about it. And they thought about it, says, well, actually, let's take the antibiotics for two weeks and see if that works. And then we'll go get an MRI if it hasn't. And we'll pay the $700. Well, the antibiotics work for that individual. But, but these are scenarios that, that this shouldn't, we, we shouldn't be put into and, and be there. But bottom line was we, we had an individual uh, that, was, that actually grew up, graduated in Lethbridge and was working down um, in Washington and, and was you know, one of the top radiologists um, down there. But he wanted to come back to Lethbridge. But no MRI, nothing there. And, and this couldn't happen. And I, I was talking to the health officials and stuff and, and uh, saying, you know, look, like, why can't we get an MRI there? There's a one year wait. Like, this is, this is critical for health. This is Alberta. We're supposed to have the best in the world. Why don't we have it? And, and, and they, in a patronizing way, patted me on the back, says, well, Paul, what you don't understand is somebody with that kind of education doesn't want to live in a bodunk place like Lethbridge. They want to be in Calgary or Edmonton. And I just looked at them and I said, your, your arrogance is stunning to me that, that you would, would say that. Um, you have no idea. You're judging again and again. But this is central government, um, these elites that, that know how to run everything and tell you what's best for your life. It's not that you want to live in a small town. You have to be able to be there where there's a, a hockey team, you know, NHL, where there's a Philharmonics. All of these things are important, Paul, to educated people, and they don't want to be down in Lethbridge. This is the mentality of central government. This is the mentality of elites that, that run things and why you need to eliminate them and get rid of them and, and, and have local organizations. Uh, again, I'm going to refer back to President Washington and, and the bloodletting. Um, I've got documents that I was able to acquire in 2004 on the taxes that were paid by individuals to the federal and provincial government. It's gobsmacking, even 20 years later, to show you those numbers, that much came from Claire's home, that much came from Lac La Biche, that much is there when they're, they're scraping to get enough money together to be able to heat and run their facilities. The, 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 the economic um, bloodletting that, that happens in our communities is astounding, and we need to change that. Um, we could actually have a lot more health care in our local areas if in fact that money was there and they want to have um, a health facility in their towns but but again it goes back to the problem of centralized health care go ahead Gaylord Paul it's not just about it's not just about accessibility it's about safety right now at this very minute there's a patient lying in a CT scanner in this city getting hundreds of thousand times the radiation they would get because they're in the ER for an acute abdomen and they now get a CT as opposed to an MRI. Hundreds of thousand times more radiation simply because AHS wants to spend it on bureaucrats. Yep. Well, that, that's another one of the problems that, that it, it amazes me when the minister was to go to one of these bureaucrats and say, we need to make cuts. And when they come back with their explanation, it's all about the front line. Um, no, you don't need to worry about cutting the front line. Danny, could you pour me a glass of water and bring that up, please? Uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's amazing the disconnect. And again, that protectionism that it's at the top and always there when, when it needs to be from the bottom going up. Uh, Frontline workers need to be protected um, and, and their jobs, not the other way around because management always wants to make cut. They're, they're the most important person in the room, even if they're not capable. And again, like the chief could, was a paramedic, could, he could help. Often they are and they won't do it though. So anyways, let, let, let's go back to the MRI. They, they finally raised the money, that individual moved back and, and, and then Lethbridge has one. Um, Rocky View back in 2012 or whatever, um, prostate cancer. Uh, 
So it's a major problem for a lot of people. Green light laser, uh, amazing phenomenal um, technique, um, way for treatment, but Alberta Health Services decide, you know what, we only need one in the province. Uh, we need to go up and it needs to be in, in Edmonton. Are, are, are you kidding me? Um, it, it just, it, it goes on and on. And, and so to go back to the Rocky view and that night with those individuals that were there, uh, it, it, it's wrong and management doesn't go down there. And again, I, uh, because of my background and my businesses and stuff, um, frontline worker, that there's nothing more valuable for the person who's running an operation to actually know and understand what that operation is at the front line. It's not that you have a business degree. Um, it's not that you, you have all these, this, this book smart stuff. It's that you actually really do understand and know what you're trying to provide for the individuals and how it works. And then even more important, to be open-minded enough that when someone comes along with a new idea, to let them try it. Where would we be in, the, in Alberta if we allowed the different doctors to, to, to practice what they think is an option to, to do? And again, let, let this go back to our COVID problem, that the censorship, the vicious attacks, you know, we got uh, Dr. Nagasi here that, that, you know, he's lost his, uh, the, the College of Physicians and Licensed want us to strip him away to practice. Um, innovation is what's so critical. And again, that goes back to the, the, the next problem of the story of an individual in, what would it be, 2018? Um, again, goes to the Lethbridge Hospital, um, sent away. Uh, it says, go to your doctor's clinic, sent away. Um, gets home and, and has, a, has a problem and calls the ambulance to come in. Um, I actually went with his individuals to meet with the officials of Lethbridge Hospital. It says, let, let me come in and talk to them. That They had the gall to tell them is that, you know, we're actually reviewing our, our, our protocol and what we do, and we realize we need to update it. And I says, are, are you kidding me? 2018, you guys have been centralized all the time, and, and you're telling me that, oh, we realize that this incident was unacceptable and we were wrong, but, you know, we can't be held liable, but... We're, we're going to change the protocol, but, but the bureaucracy and the time that it takes, um, it, it's unacceptable. It's wrong. Um, I'm going to go to another sad and tragic incident. Uh, and again, I couldn't, I didn't look up the year, but, but we boiled a couple of seniors to death in senior care facilities. Um, how, how many people remember those incidents? Um, you know, in, in a democratic and free society, you know, negligible, negligible, negligibility causing homicide or willful, um, you know, negligence, they need to be in our laws. Had that young individual who burned or boiled that first senior to death had, had been charged and went to jail, that, that would have, I think, cured the, the problem, that we had a repeat. But, but the, instead, the, the, the protocol that's been put in place of, of have two people, you got to sign off, you got to put in a thermometer, you got to have a new uh, $1,200 tap that won't let it go in there, you got to have another one. It's unbelievable the protocol that we went through and the expense and the cost of facilities now, rather than holding people accountable for the mistakes they made. Oh no, in our healthcare system, there isn't that, that liability that you talk about, that they want to protect the overall system, but yet they don't protect the individual. But, but these are just some of, of so many, so many problems here um, with our healthcare system. Um, I, I think, what time am I supposed to go to, Danny? Because I should be wrapping up. But I, I, I'm gonna go through, I, I guess I wanna go, over what I, I consider some of the other problems that, that we have. And, and I wanna start with, again, we, we need to decentralize the uh, um, operations of our hospital. We actually need to hire hospital administrator that, that actually makes the decision and says, you know what? I think that we can have a green light laser here. The demand is such um, that that's great. And so how, how do we allow that innovation? Well, first of all, we get rid of global funding. Um, it, it just amazes me, uh, and again, I'm going to go off on another side example to come back. When I first got elected in 2004, I was the only um, uh, survivor of the Alberta Alliance. 83 of us ran. I, I got in and, and, and was elected, and they, they kind of shunned me, and they put me in the janitor's closet uh, down in the basement of the AGT. It wasn't the basement, on the main floor. And so anybody wanted to come in to see me, I'd say, well, come in the front doors, turn right, and I'll be there. Because they'd all say they'd been to other ones. Well, like, uh, what floor are you on? What do I say to the security guards? Oh, you don't need to talk to them. You can just come into my office. I'm easily accessible. And, 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 and I could go. Um, but it, it, it was so frustrating 
to, to see the, the way that they would control things. Um, and I've, I've uh, got to go back here again. Sorry, going on these sidetracks is not good. But the, the global funding and the problems that were there. So there I am, single person, um, trying to make ends meet. And, and again, when you're up there and you got 56 bills coming in, it's just, just massive, the research and the studying you try and do. And so um, they, they didn't give me the full funding that the other individuals got. And that, that, that's fine. So I'll make do. But bottom line is I saved $15,000 for March 31st year end that I could use to hire extra staff while the house was sitting. And I went up to the legislator accountant and showed her that and he laughed and said, oh, Paul, you're so naive. I said, what do you mean? He says, like, like you can't save that $15,000 into next year. If you don't spend it, you lose it. Are you kidding me? No, nope. spend it or lose it. But, but this is the way our systems run. Um, there's no zero based uh, finance or accounting. You, you don't look at what you actually need. And all of these departments are running. Healthcare is the same problem. It's how many individuals do you have? You know, how many beds do you have? What services do you, do you provide? And it's called global funding. It, it's, it's just, it's asinine to think that we would even think that way, that this is something good and not change that. And, and just, again, snap, zero based budgeting. You're going to start here. Hospitals start there. But Stephen Duckett, how many remember him? The famous cookie monster came out here. I'm busy eating my cookie. Do you know what his expertise was? He was actually figuring out. He was an accountant, a medical accountant. His, his expertise was, was to go into a hospital like the Foothills or the Rocky View or whatever else and figure out what it actually cost them to provide an MRI, what it cost them to do that. Um, they, they fired him. That, that last year, they should have actually had him do what his expertise was and say, what's the cost? Of, of all of these things, and again, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Redmond last night, you know, when he was talking about moving the transportation out, and, and they, they, everything was itemized, and they knew, well, that's the way our medical system should be. We should know what it costs down in the U.S., and again, we don't want that system, but, but they know that that's a 25-cent syringe or a $250 uh, item, and, and it's there, and it's recognized. Um, this idea of global funding, uh, again, is just an insult to Albertans and an insult to our, our system. We, we actually need that co competition inside our health care to where an administrator can say, you know what, um, we can get an MRI out here and I want to say some little town, you know, maybe even Bow Island, where, where's the laid laws, <laughs> and, and say, you know what, Be because, because people will come there because they don't need to wait six months and we can provide it. And then the funding comes and all of a sudden that, that growth, that, that, that domino effect of funding following the service is there. But we, we need administrators to be able to look at the problems, what, what's happening there. Ta Taper is another wonderful example where they, they've been out there and been innovators on, on, on leading many changes. And, and again, they, they had a, a Dr. Tory that came in that specialized, but they couldn't get the equipment in there. They raised the money to get it. And, and now people go to Tabor to get the, this diagnostic work done because there's a person there. But, but our, our whole system is, is just, it's like a, a great big Gordian knot that we can't untie when we just need to take the sword and just cut it and, and, and start over, in my opinion, to, to say that we're trying to try and save every, anything. Uh, no, we, we, we need to let the hospital administrator in there. We need to have funding following the service and, and they start to make the decisions. Another crazy thing I remember, again, and it's personal experiences and where you're representing the foothills. But the podiatrists or whatever, they'd used up their funding in January, year ends March 31st. They literally shut down the whole department for two months because they'd used up their global funding because there's too many emergencies that year. It, it's just like, who, who in their right mind looks at these things and think that we have something that's successful and that, that this is the way to do it? The, the, the numbness that, that goes on and, 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 and the, the denial to, to me is beyond my comprehension. I, I, I can't understand it, but it, the world's becoming more and more crazier. We look at COVID and, and this the universal uh, approach that's being taken in, in the democratic free world is, is unbelievable. The draconian activities that they're taking, stripping away our freedoms, you just think that this couldn't be possible. If this was written in a book two years ago, I, I don't think there'd be very many uh, Albertans that would say that this is impossible, Paul, you're, you're, you're crazy. You're a conspiracy theorist, you're a tinfoil hatter, but yet here we are, and what are we going to do about it? And so let's go back, and, and, and I guess I want to say one other thing, too, that, that 
The last time to my memory uh, was 1983. I, I received my yearly um, Alberta Blue Cross expenses. I had a son that year, but you actually knew what the charges were and that, oh yeah, I had a son. Oh yeah, my other kid had an x-ray. And, and you saw that, that, that here's, here's your medical um, activity for the year and the expenses. One of the other disconnects is, is that we as Albertans have absolutely zero knowledge of what anything costs. We, we don't even make our own personal judgment. It, just because I'm a penny pincher and I'm thrifty, um, I, I, I run my life that way. And so I, I always look at it. And people say, why do you worry about that? It's not your money. It is. It, it's, our, it's our taxes. No, I'm not going to go to the hospital. I, I'd like to see an adult user fee for anybody who shows up the emergency room that isn't really an emergency and they should be going to a 24 hour walk in clinic or, or wait the next day. And when you come into the emergency room at 11 o'clock at night because you got, you know, stomach pains or headache or whatever else, and, and it's not an emergency, says, well, we'll be happy to treat you, but it's going to cost this many dollars because you really should be at, at, the, at your doctor's the next day. But, but this accountability isn't there. Nobody knows what anything costs. I, I refuse when I go into a store, if they don't have the prices on those things, I refuse to buy them. I, I want to know what I'm paying and what level of product that it's got. But yet when they're desensitizing us to where, no, you don't worry about it. You got your plastic card. You, we're, we're just, we're, we're being led down the garden path, the unaccountability, even our own in, in what money we spend because there's this credit card that, that, that it, it just ongoing and they're happy if all you pay is the principal on it, which is an outrageous 21%. But how many people are, are pulled into these economic traps and then they can't get out? This is the way our healthcare system is. We need to decentralize. We, we actually need to have local hospital administrators that are making the decisions. Um, I have no problems with unions, but, but they need to be local unions. What, what Fort McMurray needs or Calgary needs is nothing to do with what the, the, the hospital at, at Milk River needs and, and their problems. That this idea of centralizing power to, to uh, somehow leverage to, to get us ahead is wrong. Um, we, we need to change that. I remember talking to one of the administrators down in the Milk River Hospital. They, they couldn't get bleach. They, they, they put it in and they couldn't get bleach. And they finally send the guy down says, and he gets to give them the $20. Look, go, go to the hardware and, and here and get it. And, and they can't enter it into the system after that. But the, the, these are the, the kind of asinine things that go on that are just unacceptable. Go ahead, Doug. <laughs> I'll take another drink. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What, what Doug's saying is is that the centralization is really about centralized control and power. Um, is that is that fair summary? Yeah. Um, and, and and it is. It, it it takes away that individuality, that entrepreneurship, that independence, that that. Uh, self-thinking, rational thinking, because it's just following orders. Um, I, I've listened to Daniel Smith talk many, many times about the seven layers of, of management. Like, like, are you kidding me? We have managers managing managers who manage the managers. Um, it, it, it's crazy. Hey, Lord. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So he's asking, how do we disincentivize? <laughs> it's easy for you to say that this idea of, of management and their, their control. Now, I'll tell you how it, it's funding following the service. Right now, with this global funding, they look how many beds, how many services. But if, if a hospital is only paid because they actually do an x ray, because they actually do some, some lab test, something else, all of a sudden you're focused that, that there, there is no money until you've actually done something that is productive. And then you get paid for it. So you're actually managing a business. So to me, that, that's how you disincentivize, disincentivize that. So that, 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 well, I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. 
Correct. You, you should come up and give your little speech here because this is what they need to hear. Ser seriously, because there's no mic. No, 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 no. Seriously, come up, come up. Because the answers are there. The number of times that I've listened to bureaucrats and politicians say, well, that, that's all right, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Redmond, but, but it's just not politically acceptable. That, that, that's the answer that you get. So please say, say this over again. So, so the topic we're talking about is, is the Public Health Care Act, and, and there is a national one, and it frames how the provinces would work together when it's past provincial capabilities, but the powers for health belong to the provinces, right? That's under our, our national federation. We need to, with a clean sleet, sheet of paper, rewrite the Alberta Health Care Act and the Alberta Public Health Care Act. They're two separate acts. And all of the regulations which fall under them, and that's a political job. That's the responsibility of our elected officials, because they then can hold accountable all of the administration that falls under the regulation, because the regulation says how. So if you want to define and strip away all of these layers, the way you do it is in the regulation, and you pare down both the act, you, the act should be tiny, and the regulations that fall from it need to be cut in half. If you actually go and read those documents, they're unbelievable, and there's ridiculous pieces in them, and that will order AHS to do life differently. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I, I was actually going to go into that at the, the, the start, that, that this is provincial jurisdiction, and the Wild Rose Independence Party is, is we're, we're not going to listen to look to Ottawa for any guidance or any money going forward. And I want to address one other thing. This, this is such a huge subject. You know, it's only $23 billion or so of our, our budget. Um, it, we, it, again, the idea, I, I live south of Lethbridge. Lethbridge is actually the, the, the retirement center of, of seniors in Alberta. They're just complexes after complexes of seniors down there. Do you know how many ICU beds Lethbridge has? Anybody in here know that? 12, 12 ICU beds. Anybody know, you know, the changing of the name, what, what a pandemic is? But if we have 12 people in ICU with over 100,000 inside the city and then another tens of thousands outside, they're, they're, again, the integrity of their healthcare system is challenged. 12. It's unacceptable. It's wrong. Just, just talking about the capacity and, and what we need. Doug. Yeah. Give it back to the provinces. Yeah. Um, well, I should make Doug do that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be Max's spokesperson, but the bottom line is, is that Max is going to decentralize and, and the, send the money back. I, I don't totally agree with it because we, we send $50 billion, not counting the GST. I guess that's counting the GST, but, but that, that, that's not... Um, it, it, what, what Max is saying, what needs to do is it's not the federal government's responsibility. And, and again, our problem goes with our taxation system. That's another whole thing that I would talk about. Uh, our taxation system needs to be local. The money comes from our towns, whether it's Calgary or whether it's Milk River or Lac La Biche. Um, the, the money is there and, and it needs to be collected locally and not be allowed to send to some central government who's going to decide how to break it up and where to send it back. Um, it, it, it's upside down and backwards, but yes, we need to rewrite an Alberta Health Care Act. We need to put the patient at, at the front line, and, and I want to go back to the taxation and the problem, because everybody says that our, our workers are 30% overpaid, and, and on and on and on about that. No, our, our, our taxes are 30% over. There's no reason, and again, the first and most important thing that the Alberta government should be doing, and Jason Kenney should do this tomorrow, is to say we are no longer going to tax are, we're not going to tax Albertans twice. Uh, Albertans pay their provincial tax. It, it gets sent up to Alberta. And then we have all kinds of provincial employees from nurses, senior care facilities, firemen, all of these things are paid with Alberta taxpayers' money. 
And then the Alberta government um, sends their T4 to Ottawa. Not a chance, not a chance. We will keep our T4s from all of our public employees, and that's an immediate 25 to 30 percent savings for the Alberta taxpayers. And we can afford to pay our nurses and our doctors $100,000, or our nurses and our teachers and those ones $100,000, because we're going to actually keep that taxes here. That the finance needs to start with our provincial government. We're not going to send and tax Alberta workers twice, and that changes the whole dynamics of our healthcare system. I don't have the numbers. Uh, verified, but I understand we send about $700 million from, from provincial employees every month to Ottawa that needs to stop. Um, it's wrong, and, and the provincial government can stand up and do that. But there's just so many things that you need to step back and look at, rewrite the Provincial um, Health Care Act. We, we need to actually know the line of authority. And again, I'm going to go back when you say I'm a politician. To me, and, and again, we all have our, our, our parameters and our vision on things. A politician likes to do what's popular and follow polls. I'm an elected representative and I'm accountable and they can fire me just like they voted me in. They can vote me out. And so a politician, you can't do that to an elected representative. You can. And my goal is, is running for Alberta and running to be the premier is to be accountable to the people. And if the people don't want it done, we will stop because we'll be accountable. And sometimes what they want is wrong. I'll use the example again with, with uh, Premier Stelmack and the oil royalty review. He says uh, it's political suicide, Paul, to go against this 80% or more of Albertans want a royalty review. And I says, who cares about political suicide? What about economic suicide? And this goes over in every case, whether it's healthcare, whether it's in, uh, industry, wh whatever it is, education, it, it's not about political suicide. It's about providing the services that we need, having a great accountable government that understands its roles and responsibilities. And it always starts at the local level and the individual. And this idea of centralized everything else and sending money, we won't be any further ahead as a sovereign country if we're sending all the money to Edmonton like we did to Ottawa. We can't do that. It needs to be collected and kept locally. And then we look at what, what's, our, what, what's our share of the cost of what's out there, and I'll use the military because I always like this one best, is that we're less than 10% of the population. If the military expense is $15 billion here in Canada, we send our $1.5 billion because we support the military. And whether it's you know border security or whatever else, you, you look at that and what the provincial or federal government needs to provide, we look at it, we analyze it. We need to actually change the structure. And let's say we stayed inside Canada, you have three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal. They need to sit down as a business and say, what's our breakdown on this? Wow, 40% of all of our expenses are municipal. Wow, 40% of our expenses are federal. And, and you actually know what your responsibility is. 20% is provincial. Okay, all the taxes that are collected go into one pot, and then 40% of every tax goes to the municipal, 20% to the provincial, 40% to the federal. And when they want to fight over taxes, they actually go back and have to fight amongst themselves. And you don't get this overlap of, oh, we want to sponsor this hospital, or we want to sponsor this paved road or something else. We want our name on that plaque. It's disgusting the way it's set up. If it's wrong and it needs to be changed, and we can do that. And I'm excited about what we can offer to Albertans, that we can actually offer an exciting government that's there, accountable to the people, and focused on the services provided. But thank you very much. Um, we've got a few minutes. I think we can take a few questions, but I... I just wanted to say a few things first. I, I think one thing I'm catching from Paul is I'll get talking about one thing and then it gets <laughs> sidetracked off to another story. And then before long, I can't remember what I was talking about to start with. But in any event, last night I was talking about him and Maxime and uh, the fact that basically the, there are two people that I know and we were, we're talking about politicians who most of whom had never studied anything in their life except how to get elected. And that, uh, you know, Paul and Maxime are two that I do know that have basically spent their lives you know, thinking about how to govern, not just how about how to get elected. And as you know, Paul has a sidetrack story for every story, you know what I mean? And it's because he spent his life thinking about this stuff. And so we certainly appreciate you about that, about you, Paul. And the other thing that we appreciate you about you is you mentioned Mount Everest. And uh, does anybody here in the room know who led the first successful expedition to the top of Mount Everest? Yeah, that, that's the usual answer, and it's like it's wrong just like it usually is, but nevertheless, the, uh, but it was sort of a trick question because uh, the question was who led the first successful expedition. His, act, his name was actually William Hunt, and the reason no one had succeeded before they did 
was because it was always some rich person that wanted to be the first person to get to the to top of Mount Everest. So he would put together a team and they would head for Mount Everest. And when he ran out of auction, they would come back home a failure. Well, William's hunt plan was, and he told this to his team when they were getting organized. He said, we're going to head for, the, for Mount Everest. And when we get to where we can see the summit, whoever's most able to go forward will go forward. As it turned out, it was Edmund Hillary, as we all know. And uh, I always liken Paul to that because he's sort of like William Hunt. Look, he wants to get the job done. He wants to be successful. We're actually climbing a mountain that, quite frankly, I don't know if we can climb this one or not, but the only way we'll do it is if we put together a team of people who don't care who gets the credit. They just want to get to the top of the mountain. So thank you for that, Paul. I think you'll do well. But have, have, having, well, yes. Yeah, let's give him a standing ovation. For that. Yeah, yeah. Paul. Paul, has, Paul has spent his life thinking about this stuff, and I've certainly come to admire him for that. But now he's going to be mad at me here right now because uh, I want to do something that I don't do very often. I want to thank Rachel Notley for something. And uh, to, to her credit, when she was the premier, we invited her to every single conference. And we always got the nicest letter back saying that she was busy, which was fine by us, you know, because we probably didn't have a lot of things that we wanted to talk to her about anyway. But to her credit, she always wrote back and said, thank you very much. Well, I'm getting like last night. I mean, as you know, uh, Paul and Maxime were here, but I, uh, Travis Tabes, who's our minister of finance, we, we were on the cattlemen's together for 15 or 20 years. I've forgotten how long. And I, I called his office at least six or seven times. And I said, well, I'd like, I'd like somebody to at least call me back and say, he, he got your message. Uh, we wanted to come and speak about what he thought the referendum meant to Alberta. And I said, I'd like, to, I'd like him, someone to call back from the office and say, he, I, he actually got the message, but thank you very much. He's not coming. You know what I mean? But then I would know, because I, I hate to say this, if something happened in his office and he didn't really get asked, if it's like some, somebody in his office thought, well, you don't need to go and talk to that. You don't even need to know about it. But the fact of the matter is I asked him to get back to him and he never did. And so we invited him. We also invited, uh, we also invited Aaron O'Toole, you know what I mean? And so like, uh, to me, of course, we're, we're fond of uh, Paul and Max, but I mean, the, the reason we are is because we ask him, we're having a discussion. We're not necessarily taking sides, but we're, uh, we're inviting to the meeting. The other, the other person that we tried to ask, and I'm getting like old and cynical here because I said, Rachel, we always wrote her a really nice letter, but I called her MLA and I said, we're having a healthcare conference. Would you like to ask the Minister of Health if he'd like to come? And I said, it, it, like I said, like, I'm not going to, it takes actually quite a bit of time to write a polite letter explaining what you're doing and what you're hoping they'll do. So I said, I'm tired of writing letters. And I said, but ask him if he'd like to come. And if he'd like to come, I'll take the time to write him a really polite letter asking him to come. But anyway, like he said, uh, you don't know that you know he doesn't want to come. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, like, like we, we've tried to invite these people. Here we are, we're, we're talking about leading the health, you know, uh, healthcare challenge. And I mean, wouldn't you think the minister of, of health could come and say, well, this is, this is our thoughts on it. You could have a question and answer with us. And I just want to say one other thing that you talk about decentralization. We had the pleasure and the honor of traveling with Danielle for a couple of weeks in 2011. And uh, we, they were talking about, uh, that was when they had just centralized the laundry. And they said like, it used to be like, like every day, like somebody would say, oh, you know, Danny lost his hearing aids, go down to the laundry and get his hearing aids back. And they would just go to the laundry and say, are there any hearing aids here or false teeth or whatever you happen to have lost that day. But once they centralized it, of course, it all went to Peace River and there was no way of finding out, finding anybody's, maybe you could find their hearing aids. I don't think you'd want to find their false teeth, but in any event, uh, but uh, our friend Elna Edsvik, who was on our board in uh, Vermilion, she was on the advisory board to the hospital in Vermilion. So she made an appointment to talk to the head guy who'd uh, done the, the centralizing. They, got, he, they had a special meeting. He came out from Lacombe and she said, well, I'd like to know like what it costs to uh, like wash a sheet in Vermilion when we were doing it. And what does it cost for you to do it now? And he said, it was a longer discussion of this, but he said, well, why would that matter? Like he said, we're doing it in volume. Like it's cheaper when you do it in volume. And she said, well, how do you know that if you don't know what the first number was and you don't know what the second number is? So, so that's, that's what a bizarre, bizarre book, book, smart. book smart. Yeah, my friend calls them so highly educated, they're no earthly use, you know what I mean? But in any event, uh, do we, we, we have, do have time for one or two questions of Paul, if anybody would like that. Don, do you want to ask a question or are you just stretching your back? 
Okay, fair enough. Okay, fair enough. Okay, well, that's uh, it's uh, we're basically at uh, we're basically at 12 o'clock. We'll have lunch and then uh, we'll let uh, we'll let Paul him and introduce our uh, our favorite dinner speaker, other than Andrew Lawton, who got to speak yesterday at dinner, but in any event, okay, let's let's take a break for lunch. <laughs>